Welcome to Smart Women Talk. This is your host, Katana Abbott. I'm a midlife millionaire coach and a certified financial planner, and I search the world for smart women and a few good men, including best-selling authors and thought leaders who are on that leading edge. So join us for conversations on money, business, health, and inspiration, so you can live with more purpose, passion, and prosperity. Hello and welcome to Smart Women Talk. This is your host, Katana Abbott. And this month, we are celebrating Earth Day and we're talking about all the issues related to climate change. So today, I'm going to be speaking with the president and the CEO of the Detroit Regional Chamber, Sandy Barra, about the climate crisis and this move to electric vehicles here in Detroit, which is the home of the automotive industry. So today, Sandy is going to share with us what Detroit is doing to fight climate change, how General Motors is leading the charge in electric vehicles, and some challenges we are facing to make it happen. So let me tell you a little bit about Sandy Barra. He is the president and CEO of the Detroit Regional Chamber, which is the third largest chamber of commerce in the nation. He served the President George Bush Um, W. Bush as administrator of the U.S. Small Business Administration. He was appointed to the Detroit branch of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, and he is a frequent commentator on local and national media regarding political developments, automotive industry matters, and Detroit and Michigan issues as well. Sandy and his wife, um, Lisa Barra, have one son. They live in a household that's run by family pets, and they previously lived in Portland, Oregon, and Washington, D.C. So we are so thrilled that you've made Detroit your home, and I'm just excited to have you here, Sandy. Thanks for joining us on Smart Women Talk. Well, Katana, it's so nice to be with you, and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. So... Quite a few years ago, um, a friend of mine, uh, Suzanne, and I had invited you to come meet us um, at Somerset, and we had lunch, and I remember you telling me about um, this vision that we had here in Detroit of, and I, I think it was General Motors, that we were moving to electric vehicles, and it, and it really wasn't even, um, as far as the public went, really on the radar for many people. Maybe the Prius was out there, um, and you said something to me that caught my attention, and it was that there would be these autonomous electric vehicles driving around, and we would be able to summon one of those vehicles to come and pick us up, and that a lot of people wouldn't even have cars anymore. Now, is that something that we're moving towards? or what? Tell, tell me about where that came from. Why did you mention it back then? First of all, uh, Katana, I have to applaud you on your memory. Uh, I barely <laughs> remember what I had you know, for dinner last night. You remember a conversation from six years ago. So, so kudos. Uh, but yes, that, that vision is still, uh, I'm confident that vision is still going to be a reality. It has bobbed and weaved uh, over the last six years since you and I first talked about it. But clearly, you know, uh, the move to electrification to make our vehicles electric uh, is happening. It's happening now. Uh, there's been an explosion of options for consumers uh, by all sorts of companies, domestic companies, foreign companies, uh, to go to electric. Uh, and one of the things that are, is driving it, in addition to you know people being concerned about the environment, is that government regulations, especially in other countries, especially in Europe uh, and China now, uh, are really making it a mandate to move to electrification. Uh, so there's a lot of forces that are driving a greater, I would say a much greater degree of electrification in the vehicle fleet uh, of the cars that you and I are gonna be buying really starting tomorrow. Uh, autonomous vehicles are a different story. Uh, I would say six years ago, I was a little bit more optimistic about the speed in which autonomous vehicles were going to hit the market. Uh, There was a lot of development uh, happening five, 10 years ago that was really, really promising. Uh, I think that the industry has found that it is far more difficult uh, to create these autonomous vehicles than we initially thought. So that's going to take a little bit longer, at least than I had initially thought. Okay, so there, we're really looking at two big issues, two different issues here with autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles. 
Um, and I understand that San Francisco has a project going with the autonomous vehicles right now. Yeah, many cities do. I mean, we do uh, right here in Detroit, uh, you know, Austin, Phoenix, uh, you know, obviously the Bay Area, uh, you know, uh, I'm, 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 I'm scrolling a little bit, uh, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh in particular. A lot of cities are uh, have partnerships with uh, autonomous vehicle uh, technology companies or with uh, OEMs, and for those of you who don't know what OEM stands for, it's very much a Detroit term. It stands for original equipment manufacturer. That would include like Volkswagen, Ford, General Motors, Toyota, etc. Uh, to to really deploy test autonomous vehicles out on the road. Not all of them are electric. Some of them are electric. Some of them are hybrid. Some of them are old-fashioned gas-powered engines. Uh, I think the news that you're referring to, Katana, is that San Francisco has now has now allows testing of autonomous vehicles on their public streets without a driver on board. Uh, and that's one of the few places in the country that has allowed that. But we're going to see many, many more cities, regions, states, uh, not just across the country, but across the globe that are going to allow the testing of autonomous vehicles without any human beings on board. In fact, it's already happening in the United States with semi-trucks. So, yeah, I mean, that's huge because I remember taking a trip last year and I actually, oh, I know what it was. A couple of years ago, my husband took a sabbatical and we were going through part of the country where it was just, there was more trucks than, um, than automobiles on the road. I don't know what highway it was. Um, and how will that affect the economy when you have so many vehicles, so many trucks with no drivers? So that's a really great question. So uh, the trucking industry faces an incredible worker shortage now. In fact, one of the reasons why we're seeing such high inflation, why we're seeing bottlenecks in the supply chain globally is that uh, the world, but particularly the United States, does not have enough truck drivers to get you know, everything from you know, our, our, our new vehicles to toilet paper from point A to point B. That crisis in trucking is only going to exacerbate because the average age of uh, North American truckers is quite old. They're all getting ready to retire. They are having a hard time filling uh, the pipeline because frankly, it's very difficult work. It's long hours. You're away from home a lot. So autonomous uh, trucking, uh, one, uh, you know, with the way the technology is deploying, you know, adds a safety element. I mean, you know, autonomous trucks do not fall asleep. Not that that happens a lot, but when it does, it's obviously quite tragic for, for, for a lot of people. Uh, but also what we see is that the efficiency that will get created with autonomous trucking uh, that, you know, th those trucks can go all night. Right, you know, because they because they never get tired. There's a lot of benefits to that, uh, and it does uh, will start help alleviate this the supply shortage we have in in human uh, in human beings who want to drive trucks. Well, and the trucks don't have to take um, drugs to keep them awake. <laughs> yes, I, I, yeah. So when you ask about you know uh, potential you know economic fallout, yeah, uh, you know you know certainly I think the energy company uh, energy drink companies might. Uh, might see some. But, you know, anytime there is a transformational technology, mm -hmm. and we can just look back at history, when we moved from an agrarian society, you know, to an industrial society, as we've moved from an industrial society to an information technology society, you know, jobs do go away. There is no doubt about that. But in the churn, and as new technologies and new industries get created, you know, tremendous amounts of new jobs always, always get created. The challenge is, is that if I'm someone who, you know, was a master, say, you know, buggy whip manufacturer, or if I was a, if I was a company that specialized in eight track tape players, uh, you know, if I'm not ready for that new technology, if I'm not ready for that new skill set that it's going to take for me as an individual or me as a company to adapt to the new world, you know, then, then I'm going to be in trouble. And we see that in every transition where people and companies are unable to make that transition and they do fall on hard times. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, and this is a huge, can you talk about how huge and important this transition from the combustion engine to electric vehicles really is? 
because, yeah. you know, we hear a little bit here and there on the news, but you probably know something from behind the scenes, what's really going on and how important it is. Yeah, I mean, that is a, a question that, you, you know, we could take the answer any number of ways. So, you know, let me try and probably not <laughs> successfully, but I'll try to maybe distill it down just a touch. So, you know, obviously, from an environmental standpoint, there are some, you know, real benefits, but there's some real uh uh, warning signs on on the horizon as we move to electric vehicles. So you know, number one, obviously, you know, uh, like you know, our family has a, an electric vehicle, and we have uh, another one on order. And uh, so, and I feel really good. Uh, you know, in the time that we've had the electric vehicle that we have, we put about six thousand miles on, and I feel really good that uh, you know we use it just in our community. We call it the golf cart. Uh, that, you know, as I've been driving around, you know, my little community here that I know that for 6,000 miles over the last year, you know, I haven't been adding any pollutants to our little community. And I, I feel really good about that. Now we have to, you know, um, you know, uh, understand the flip side of that, right? Uh, a lot of energy across the planet, including the United States is still coal generated. Uh, and that creates, you know, obviously environmental issues. Uh, also, you know, these batteries as they're currently constituted, you know, have a lot of rare earth materials in them. And, you know, so, you know, no one that I know of has done a really, really, really detailed comprehensive supply chain analysis of, okay, you know, you know, how much does the overall, you know, uh, pollutants uh, or environmental damage of the creation of an electric vehicle, the powering of an electric vehicle compared to an internal combustion uh, engine? Because internal combustion engines, to be perfectly fair, have uh, been, uh, are so much more efficient, so much cleaner than they were, frankly, than even 10 years ago. I don't think people even understand how much uh, advancement there's been in the in internal combustion engine. So that is generally a positive, but we, but we have to say it, it's not a panacea. We have to understand that there are some uh, downsides uh, to uh, the, the production of battery-powered uh, vehicles. Right. And I, and I know that a lot of people um, listening, um, some of them may have seen the show on 60 Minutes, where... Um, um, Paola, I think it was, um, the Philippines, and they showed that there was a company there that was mining um, for nickel, and it was creating, you know, tremendous environmental damage. And I mean, this was a place that looked like one of the most pristine places in um, Costa Rica. And I remember getting, you know, very upset about that, um, watching that happen. And, um, but then we also, you have to get the lithium as well. Um, now, a lot of the these rare minerals come from other countries, possibly like China or Russia. And with what's going on politically right now, um, what kind of risk does that pose? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a really great question. The supply chain for uh, battery production is incredibly complex. And as you so rightly note, uh, that a lot of these, uh, uh, these are rare earth materials. And when you think of it, rare earth materials means exactly what it sounds like. These are very rare and they're in the earth and they have to be, you know, they have to be gotten out of some pretty destructive, uh, destructive ways. So as we look at kind of, you know, the, you know, the, uh, you know energy security issues, uh, you know, what that should tell all of us is that, uh, you know, we are not moving completely away from internal combustion engines. And there's, there is a whole, you know, we can have a whole discussion about kind of what the dynamics of that are likely to, to be. We're going to go, we're going to be a much more electrified uh, 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 society uh, when it comes to transport, which is a good thing, but there are problems to solve along the way. And, you know, how we create batteries that have more power density, that are able to create more power density without, uh, you know, the the uh, the high need for these rare earth materials. Uh, that's kind of what we see uh, happening right now across the mobility industry. It's kind of a race to figure out that, you know, to solve for that X. Uh, we're not there yet, uh, but 
you know, lots and lots of smart companies and people are working on, you know, how do we get more energy density? How do we make uh, these batteries without as many air, rare earth materials? And at the back end, how do we ensure that these uh, batteries are recyclable? Fortunately, from what I understand, the recyclability of batteries is, is a much easier question to solve. Uh, not that we've mastered it yet, but people say, oh my goodness, what are we going to do with all these batteries? You know, are they going to be in landfills? The answer is absolutely not. Uh, and the good news is, is that these batteries do seem to last a really, really long time. Yeah, yeah, they do. And I can tell you, I had a Prius and I was in a pretty bad car accident. And because my Prius was so heavy, um, I wasn't killed <laughs> and my car didn't, fly. I was um, going to the Zilwaukee bridge and I would have been just thrown off this median and I, my car just went a few feet. And so it really did save my life. <laughs> well, that's good, but we'll certainly, we're glad, we're, we're glad that you're safe, but yeah, you know, and you know, the, uh, uh, you know, safety in a vehicle, I mean, you know, weight certainly has something to do with it. I mean, weight certainly makes people feel more comfortable, mm -hmm. especially the, one of the reasons why people really love electric cars is because uh, generally all the weights on the floor in the floor. So you have a very low center of gravity. You feel very planted. Uh, you feel very secure. But when it comes to actual, you know, safety, how safe is a vehicle? That's all about vehicle structural engineering. Um, and, you know, you can have a heavy car that's not safe and you can have a heavy car that's very safe. You can have a light car that's actually surprisingly safe. Uh, it really has to do with, with how well they, uh, they engineer the, the safety cell uh, around the passenger compartment and, you know, what are the other mitigation uh, technologies that they use uh, to keep passengers safe. It's, 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 it, it, that too is a complex issue. Yeah, well, it was just, it was great, you know, and I noticed too, driving um, in the snow was amazing with that Prius too. It was front wheel drive, but just, it was so heavy. Right. That, um, you know, I was able to drive, I couldn't believe it. My car was down in the snow and it was like a little plow. So yeah. um, I like that. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what Detroit is doing with automotive and with the move to electric vehicles and specifically with the big three. What would you like to share with what you've seen watching this transition over this last decade? Yeah, so certainly, I mean, you know, what we used to call the big three, uh, now we just call them the Detroit three, uh, <laughs> which obviously is, you know, you know, Ford Motor Company, General Motors, and, and now Stellantis, uh, formerly known as Chrysler. Uh, you know, uh, I would say certainly Ford and General Motors are very much, you know, leading the pack along with a handful of other companies across the globe in this transition to electrified vehicles. Uh, they're, you know, so the products that they have launched, I mean, you know, is specifically, you know, I would say, you know, the Ford Mustang uh, Mach-E and the Ford Lightning, um, you know, the Mach-E is obviously available now. There is a months long waiting list to get one, you know, very, very, very well reviewed uh, by, uh, by industry and uh, analysis. Uh, the, uh, some of the products that General Motors has, uh, General Motors is getting ready to launch a flurry of new uh, electrified vehicles. I mean, we've seen some of them already, you know, the Silverado EV pickup and the, the, and the Hummer uh, pickup, uh, you know, again, you know, pretty spectacular uh, examples of, of, of engineering. Uh, they do some really, really cool things. Uh, the Cadillac Lyric, another General Motors product that we've seen that is going to hit the streets, you know, pr uh, pretty soon. So, you know, they're, they're creating very much world-class products, world-class products in terms of, you know, the, the range uh, that they're, they're achieving, the, you know, the, the, cus the customer com comfort features, that they're looking for, you know, Stellantis is, is I would say, you know, uh, behind, but I wouldn't say they're 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 fully behind. They've uh, they've announced uh, that they're going to uh, uh, basically reinvent and reinvigorate the Chrysler brand as an EV brand, and they've already floated their first product uh, under the Chrysler uh, brand name, which will be called the Airflow. And for the handful of people out there who are listening, who are incredible car geeks, will recognize the Airflow as a car that Chrysler built in the 1930s that was way ahead of its time, uh, a real technological marvel. Unfortunately, it was a complete disaster in the marketplace. Uh, but those of us who are automotive geeks remember the Chrysler Airflow with great fondness.
Wow, interesting. Well, is there um, is there anything else you want to share as far as either um, you know opportunities or challenges that are ahead for and I'm and I'm thinking um, for Detroit specifically. Yeah. So, you know, for, you know, for, for, you know, well, like for the, let's, let's, let's take it away from the companies just for a second and, and focus on the city. So, you know, the city of Detroit is one of the few cities in the country uh, that has a chief mobility officer. And this was something that Mayor Duggan, who serves as the mayor of Detroit, uh, decided to do a few years ago to really ensure that this revolution in mobility that is coming uh, because of electrification, because of autonomous, you know, really make sure that that deployment is, is equitable uh, for, for people that, you know, that it's, you know, that it, this does not, this transition does not uh, exclude people uh, from from getting mobility options, regardless of what their zip code is or what their in- income is. And I'm really really pleased to see that Detroit is taking this transition so seriously. Shifting back to 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 the industry, you know, one of the challenges that you know the you know the the legacy manufacturers, I mean, you know, companies like like Toyota, Volkswagen, and Ford, who you know have been in business for you know well over a hundred years and have been making you know for the most part mostly gas powered uh, cars, is that you know they have to walk and chew gum at the same time, right? They have to you know continue to make uh, advanced uh, uh, gas consuming engines to meet today's demand. They have to, you know, start, uh, not start, they have to continue to keep their customers in mind as they start creating new um, uh, electric vehicles and get customers uh, used to that uh, idea uh, because, you know, there's a lot of myths about uh, electric vehicles out there. Uh, And they have to, you know, put all of the engineering and resources into creating a leading uh, uh, electrified vehicles. I mean, just even a handful of years ago, uh, electric vehicles were kind of compliance uh, products. They were, you know, boring little boxy little things, and you know, they 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 weren't really compelling vehicles at all. And you know, they they were some some of them looked like science experiments on wheels. Now you see that electric vehicles, are, you know, the the standard is to be very fashionable. You know, very you know, very creature comfort oriented. You know, you can look at again some of the you know legacy manufacturers like Ford with the, the Mustang Mach E is a great example. But you look at some of these startups, right, like a company called. Lucid uh, is making a spectacular electric car that goes 500 miles and is it's a luxury machine that rivals uh, the Mercedes S-Class or the Jaguar XJ or you know any one of those kind of leading European uh, uh, luxury sedans. Yeah, I recently saw a commercial on that. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, is there anything else that we should be looking at, like hydrogen or you know possibly cars running on you know something else besides um, electricity or or even you know fossil yeah. fuel? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So uh, there's 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 multiple ways to uh, create electricity. Uh, you know, and so for example, you know Toyota uh, with um, Oh my goodness! Uh, I drove it in Japan. Uh, the Mirai, thank you, um, uh, is, um, uh, is 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 powered by by hydrogen. Uh, there's other cars that uh, that are out there that that do that, and, and basically those are just other ways to create electricity uh, in 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 the vehicle. Um, you know, there right now, uh, you know. Uh, 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 the, 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 the conventional wisdom is, is that, you know, power stored in a battery is the best way to power an electric vehicle. Now, that's what we know today. Might that change? Yes. Um, you know, uh, for example, you know, hydrogen, you know, uh, the transport of hydrogen is very difficult. The, you know, the storage of hydrogen is very difficult. Uh, you have to keep it at, you know, sub, you know, sub freezing Temperatures. Uh, in fact, I, I actually had to fill up um, the, uh, the the Mirai when uh, when I was in Japan uh, with the Toyota folks, and you know the you know the the, the basically the handle kind of freezes over. <laughs> it's it's it's, 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 it's it's quite the thing. So there isn't a perfect solution, but there are other options out there. Wow! Wow! Well, it's going to be so exciting to see you know what happens next. Um, so. 
you know, I want to thank you for sharing all this um, information with us about Detroit and the electric vehicle industry. But I also want you to share a little bit about this big event you're headed to um, in Mackinac Island, um, what that is and um, why it's important. And I mean, what a beautiful place to have that event. So can you just share with us? You know, I, I, well, thank you for asking. So, you know, one of the unique assets that the Detroit Regional Chamber has is for, you know, 45 plus years now, uh, we've hosted an event uh, on, on Mackinac Island at the historic Grand Hotel. And for those who aren't familiar with Michigan, between the two peninsulas, the Northern Peninsula and the Lower Peninsula in Michigan sits an island called Mackinac Island. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, it is kind of in the shadow of the great, uh, you know, Mackinac Straits Bridge. Uh, but uh, on this island, which has no cars, you can you cannot bring a car there. You have to get around by either bicycle or horse and buggy uh, or shoe leather uh, are your options. Uh, and uh, we kind of take over the Grand Hotel and we have, you know, about 1300 of our closest friends. And these are, you know, chamber board members, you know, CEOs, business CEOs that are headquartered in Michigan, you know, our political leaders, a lot of our congressional delegation, uh, is there, our leaders from the state legislature are there. And for three days, we have conversation. And we've been doing this for 45 years now. So it's a really unique event. Uh, everyone's kind of on equal footing. Uh, when I took over this job several years ago, I said, listen, let's ban the ties. You know, you're on an island. You shouldn't, you know, no matter what island you're on, with the exception of, of, uh, of Manhattan, you shouldn't wear a tie. I just think that ties are wrong on islands. So, uh, you know, so everyone's, you know, everyone's pretty casual. Uh, we bring in world-class speakers, you know, people like a Tom Friedman or a Walter Isaacson, you know, to be able to, you know, kind of, you know, stir conversation uh, and determine, you know, hey, you know, how do we solve some of Michigan's problems? That's kind of what we do. It's a lot of fun. But, but also, I think that um, having an event like that where everyone can get together and have those side-by-side um, -side conversations, how important is that? to the state of Michigan to bring all those thought leaders together like that. Yeah. So, you know, it is a way to, you know, Michigan is obviously a pretty big state, uh, uh, both geographically and population wise. And, you know, if you are a university president that is sits on the west side of the state, you know, your chances to, you know, meet and visit with a, you know, a business CEO that might be located on the east side of the state, uh, you know, you know, that wouldn't happen normally, you know, but, you know, uh, our event does bring these types of leaders together. So you've got, you know, corporate CEOs mixing with university presidents, with political leaders, with philanthropic leaders, you know, uh, all of our foundations presidents, you know, are, are generally in attendance. Um, and, you know, so we're, we're able to, you know, both formally and informally engineer these, uh, these soft conversations, if you will, um, that really lead to, you know, you know, collaborative action afterwards. And certainly, you know, making the state closer, maybe not physically, maybe not, uh, not geographically, but, you know, we're, we're creating relationships that, that makes the state seem smaller. That's, yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. And I'm thrilled. And I wish I could go there sometime. <laughs> but I just have to watch and um, see the news and see the headlines afterwards. So thank you again for being here. I know how busy you are. You're getting ready for that big event. And I just want to thank you again for sharing your wisdom and also and letting me highlight Detroit because that's I'm a Detroiter and I'm a Michigander. So thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. And it's been a pleasure to be with you. Absolutely. Thank you. So everyone, I want to thank you two for being here. And I want to make sure that you know how to join us. If you want to be part of our community and know who is coming on the show and to receive the free gifts and um, actually access articles and resources from our, from our guests, go to joinsmartwomen.com. And when you do, you'll get our monthly easing, which is theme-based. It comes um, at the first of each month. It'll highlight the guests, but you'll also be in invited to the Smart Women's Academy, which is a free online resource um, where you can take classes at no charge. So um, be sure to like us and subscribe. You can see the show on Smart Women TV and you can listen wherever you get your favorite podcasts. So until our next show, please go out and live with more purpose, passion and prosperity. 
Smart Women Talk is brought to you by Smart Women's Empowerment, a 501c3 nonprofit project of United Charitable. Music by Bill Lucas from his album, When It Rains. Available on Apple, Music, and Spotify. Catch us wherever you listen to your favorite podcast, and be sure to join our free community at joinsmartwomen.com to access all our free Smart Women resources.